Okay, we are talking about nerves and how nerve impulses are propagated down a neuron. Uh, we're thinking about action potentials, resting potentials, and all sorts of things like that. We're going to do this in two stages. The first stage is going to be looking at how a resting potential is generated. And the second stage is going to be looking at action potentials and how they are propagated down the length of a neuron. And we'll look at it under, well, vaguely under these uh, headings, nerves, pumps, leaks, and gates. Uh, uh, various visual puns coming up. Do you forgive me for them? My sense of humour is as weak as ever. So nerve cells, obviously a man with nerves of steel uh, up there. Uh, you'll have seen uh, similar diagrams to this before at GCSE. Um, note in the sensory neuron, we have uh, the cell body, uh, not at just one end of it, uh, but closer to the end that is inside the central nervous system. You'll remember that uh, from doing the reflex arc at GCSE. Uh, and uh, this is the diagram in your textbook. Uh, notice a few of the labels. Uh, on the sensory neuron, these are the dendrites, uh, which are the uh, terminuses, termini, uh, at the end of the sensory neuron with the sensory receptors at the other end. Uh, here is our long axon, or actually it's called a dendron, in the um, sensory neuron, and it's wrapped around with myelin, it's wrapped up with myelin. This is the motor neuron here, and this is our direction of impulse in this way here on that. Uh, at the end, we have these motor end plates, as they are called, motor end plates. Uh, that was nose, pumps. Uh, it's a lot about uh, pumping ions from one side to another. We'll get onto that. Uh, leaks, cue more visual puns. Um, and gates, the worst visual pun of them all, of course. Uh, gates, this is about protein channels being openable and closable. So, nerve impulses, nerve impulses are sent over long distances by action potentials. Uh, now, nerve impulse is... It says here, um, small electrical charge travels from one end of the neuron to another. Now, in the brain, that might be a very small distance indeed. But if you want to send it any further, you need to boost that electrical impulse to keep it going. Otherwise, it will just fade out and your uh, signal will become weaker and weaker. And we do this by setting off an action potential in the axon of the neuron. <clears throat> now, some background. All animal cells have a voltage across their cell membrane. It's always negative on the inside, on the cytosol side, versus uh, the outside. And in nerve cells, um, this is used to send the signal down. It, uh, it's called the resting potential, and it's about minus 70 millivolts. You'll see this used in other circumstances as well, such as in insulin secretion and we need to know how this resting potential is generated bit of background now from AS level phospholipid bilayers have their hydrophobic core to them that is generated by the uh, hydrophobic fatty acid tails which form the core of the phospholipid membrane now that means that hydrophobic molecules, they can cross at will. Here are some examples here. Um, small uncharged polar molecules, uh, they're fine as long as they are uncharged. So H2O is obviously very polar, so it's urea and glycerol, uh, but they're small enough to cross over. Large uncharged polar molecules, they can't go to so glucose. You might not think of glucose as being a large molecule, but it's large enough to not be uh, able to cross easily that phospholipid bilayer. Now, when we say it's impermeable, it, there are gradations to that, but essentially you can consider uh, anything carbohydrate size to not be able to just straightforwardly diffuse across. And then all ions. Ions may be small in themselves, but they, are, they carry with them a cluster of water molecules held in by hydrogen bonds, and that makes the whole thing much, much larger, and they can't cross that hydrophobic core. So, if an ion is to cross, a protein will be required to allow that to happen, either by facilitated diffusion or by active transport. 
again AS stuff. So from that, if we pump ions across a membrane, they will stay there. They will stay on that side and only come back very slowly uh, unless we've got another protein channel to bring them back. And here is such a pump. Now this animation happens really, really quickly. Uh, apologies for that. Um, but this is the Na plus K plus pump. Um, and we'll look at exactly what this does. But really, Na plus using ATP is pumped out and K plus is pumped into the cell. So, to put some numbers on it, ATP is used to pump three Na plus ions out and pump two K plus ions in. And all in all, about one third of our entire energy expenditure is spent on this pump. So important is it. To slow it down, <laughs> have it a bit more fixed. What does this do? Well, it means that because lots of K plus is coming back in here, we have a large concentration of K plus ions here. That gives us a large electrochemical gradient which would carry K plus from the cytosol side out into the uh, extracellular fluid. Coming across, well, Na plus is pumped out, three Na plus are pumped out, and that gives us a concentration gradient, an electrochemical gradient, if you please, going in the opposite direction for sodium. Note there's also something called an uobane binding site here. Uh, uobane acts uh, as a competitive inhibitor for this, as it can bind on to the same binding site as K plus would bind to. Hence, I meaning uobane is extraordinarily toxic. So, uh, well, let's move on. Now, <clears throat> that in itself will generate a little bit of a membrane potential because you've got three Na plus going out versus two K plus coming in, but that is only a very small part of the picture. The rest of it is generated by a leak. Now, as we recall, potassium is high inside the cell and low outside, and there are these potassium ion leak channels which are always open and allow potassium to slowly leak back out of the cytosol, back out of the cell, down that concentration gradient. Now, because they are cations, they are positively charged ions, they are leaving the cell and they're generating a charge imbalance, making the inside of the cell membrane, the cytosol side of the cell membrane, negative versus that charge outside. And this is the resting potential. So uh, in diagrammatic form we have all these K plus, right, here we go, all these K plus slowly leaking out this way and as positive charges leave the cell, well so they leave a negative charge behind and they generate a positive charge on the outside of the cell. So the inside of the cell is going to be negatively charged. And that is the resting potential. Now there are a couple of other things which contribute to this. <clears throat> there are these negatively charged proteins, so they are anionic proteins which uh, are on the cytosolic side of the cell membrane, and there are nucleic acids as well. Uh, nucleic acids are negatively charged. Um, but all in all, this generates our resting potential of minus, well it says minus 60 here, but really minus 70 millivolts. Yes, there's our, there's our little label. Um, another image of it. Now, the uh, initial experiments were done uh, literally by sticking a glass electrode inside the uh, neuron itself, inside the uh, axon of a neuron. So, a very, very careful experiment, very uh, difficult experimental technique. We only need a small number of potassium ions to move to generate this minus 70 millivolts. Um, so the pump, the Na plus K plus pump, easily maintains this concentration gradient. A tiny amount of Na plus ions, sodium ions, do leak back in. Uh, so there is a, uh, some sort of a balance, uh, but not nearly enough to balance that charge. Uh, the K plus uh, 
uh, leak out much more readily than Na plus leak back in. So, in summary, the Na plus K plus pump drives three Na plus out of the cell, bringing only two K plus back in, and that gives a small charge imbalance. K plus leak channels are open, allowing K plus to leak back out of the cell down this electrochemical gradient, and we have more K plus leaking out than Na plus leaking back in. Also contributing are these large anions such as proteins and nucleic acids inside the cell. And all this in total generates our negative charge, our resting potential relative to the outside of minus 70 millivolts. So make sure you're clear on all of these points uh, before you go on to the next video about the action potential.